and welcome to Tuesdays with Morrissey, where we share insights from great thinkers. Today, we're absolutely thrilled to be joined by Gay and Katie Hendricks. For listeners who might not be familiar, Gay and, Gay and Katie have been leaders in the field of leadership and personal development for nearly 50 years. They've written more than 40 books, including Conscious Loving and the Big Leap, trained thousands of coaches, and have hosted seminars across the globe. Gay and Katie, thank you for coming on the show. Thank you. Thank you. Great being with you. Your work has made an impact on so many people across aspects of life work, relationships, spirituality, creativity. How would you guys describe the foundational principles that guide your work? Boy, I would say the foundational principles are operating out of being real, um, taking responsibility for what's happening and co-creating something different if that's not working, and appreciation, really grounding work and, and uh relationships in that principle of appreciation. It all begins with authenticity, being authentic to what your purpose is and being authentic about what you're communicating. Does it match what's mm. going on inside you? Or is there a jangle there between those two? And also um, the really crucial experience of taking personal responsibility for something, committing to something. That's a magic making mm -hmm. thing. And it doesn't matter if you're in a close personal relationship or in a company or wherever you are, the power is always to the person who will take personal responsibility. And then creativity is mm -hmm. so important to any relationship or any business that, uh, you know, we've been in hundreds of companies and the ones where people are fostering creativity, they're fun to be there. Mm. They're electric. They're yeah. alive. And uh, those that aren't are not. <laughs> yeah, you, you mentioned authenticity and you mentioned creativity. I want to break each of those down a little mm -hmm. bit. Uh, I, I saw recently, you know, a conversation you guys did with the concept of on, authenticity is sexy. Mm. What does authenticity mean to you? Well, authenticity means uh, sharing what's actually going on in the moment in an unedited way and in a way that actually matches. So words are matching internal experience as best we can. And when that happens, there's something electric and really inspiring that happens, even if it's, you know, is not doesn't sound, you know, educated or. Or, you know, it's not uh, solving a problem. But when someone is, is being authentic and showing up that way, I can really, I feel it in my own body and I feel awakened uh, in a way when someone is just saying, you know, something rote or something socially acceptable doesn't awaken that, that connection uh, with each other and also with the wider creative universe. And also in close personal relationships, they succeed if people are able to say the simplest, profound, authentic things like I'm scared or I'm angry or I feel sad or I don't know what to do. Those kinds mm. of crucial little 10 second conversations are the things that make relationships keep flourishing rather than um, withering. Oh, and I was just thinking more as you have something that that is about. It's about communicating from your whole self. So most people have learned to live from their neck up and present their heads to the world and, you know, try to look good. And uh, when you open up to this full body expression, you're awakening a flow of aliveness in you that uh, creates more vitality, creates more uh, creativity, but also creates the possibility of connection with others. And it, it's a, a sense of speaking from discovery rather than speaking from, you know, the log jam of stuff that you always complain about. And you can see it and feel it. Um, uh, people who are in the room uh, are also, ooh, ooh, what was that? Also, there's, um, you know, we've been on television around this issue many times about speaking authentically in relationships. And we always say <laughs> the only sexual organ that really matters is your throat chakra. In other words, <laughs> being open to communication, because that is the sexiest thing. Mm -hmm. When people can be just real with each other, it has an organic sexiness to it that doesn't require alcohol or drugs or anything like that. Yeah, there, there seems to be a connection, a huge connection between honesty 
and authenticity and courage? Uh, yes, the courage, um, because most people have had experiences of being punished for telling the truth, for being authentic. You know, don't say that or don't speak to your mother that way or, oh, that was stupid. Uh, uh, and so actually having the courage to speak up with something that's going on inside, boy, that is a step toward intimacy. I was just remembering a, a session a long time ago with a couple who came in and they were sitting on the opposite ends of the couch. And uh, and um, I was trying to educate them about authenticity. And he was saying, oh, first thing he says, I don't get it. And I said, yeah, that's it. I don't get it. And then the next thing he said was, um, oh, you mean like my hands are sweaty? And I said, yes. And then after that, he dropped in. The next thing he said was, I don't know why I'm so angry. Mm -hmm. And his wife burst into tears because that was the first time that she had heard him being authentic. And so the next time they came in, she was sitting on his lap. <laughs> so that was a real indicator that authenticity um, had opened some intimacy. <laughs> Yeah, that's funny. He, it's uh, he's. It sounds like he was actually quite good at being authentic. Well, he he was. I think he had the courage to step into that and to say, yeah. "I don't know," which is also something that we're discouraged from saying. Like, oh, I don't know, uh, you know, because I should know, and adults should know. And so his courage led him to that discovery, which was very inspiring. Yeah, it makes me think about, uh, I had a guest uh, a few months ago named Liz Wiseman. She wrote a book called Multipliers about the best, how, how the best leaders are the ones that make them around them better. And really what a lot of her work's about is that we're at our best when we're on the edge of something, when we're in that not knowing, because that's when humility and openness and understanding and asking for help really shows up. Yes, well, one of our big iconic photographs here that you can't see on, on uh, the screen, it says wonder on it because wonder to us is an undiscovered treasure mm -hmm. superpower. The act of wondering opens you up to that great field of intelligence that's just beyond what we think we know mm -hmm. about the world. Einstein uh, in his uh, notebooks mentioned that he had wondered about a particular problem in physics every day for 27 years. And that, to me, <laughs> <That's> <laughs> that, that deserves some kind yeah. of Guinness Book of World Records, because <laughs> most people can't wonder for a tenth of a second, you know, without coming in with what they think they already know. But the act of pure wonder puts you right in the sweet spot of creation mm -hmm. of the universe, because how many times has the universe in all its billions of years of being, come to a place where it didn't know what to do and then invented something new. That's just the nature of this whole operation we're in here in our universe. And to be a participant in that is human beings' greatest glory mm -hmm. when we can wonder about how things could be rather than thinking they have to be a certain way. And it's an antidote to criticism, which is the default position for most people in close relationships, but in relationships of all kinds, uh, people think that criticizing has value and that it actually works. If, you know, I'm only telling you this for your own good. And if you would just, and criticism shuts down creativity, connection, and so shifting into wonder. Uh, and you can do that through appreciation. You can do that through the hmm, one of the things we use a lot in our work is having people create a pleasant hmm, mm -hmm. through a whole out breath, hmm, because you can't criticize when you're humming, and it opens the door to wonder where all of that magic can occur. Yeah, uh, Abraham Joshua Heschel, who marched with Dr. Martin Luther King at Selma, he was the one who said he felt like his legs were praying. Mm -hmm. uh, he he's written about um, wonder precedes wisdom. Mm -hmm. I uh, totally agree with that because mm -hmm. the act of wonder is an act of humility in a mm -hmm. way of saying, hmm, there's something I really want to know and hmm, I really don't know it. Let me just open up and see if I can find it somewhere in this universe. You know, those are great exalted moments where something breaks through that hasn't broken through before. 
My sense is also one of the things that we teach and I've experienced is that if I, uh, like a dandelion, if I I blow wonder out into the universe that it returns to me in ways mm-hmm. that are always supportive. And, you know, it's not like a ticker tape that just reads out, but then the universe starts answering, you know, with something that I see as I'm going uh, on through my day or, you know, some conversation that I overhear. And I love how that weave, the universe supports wonder. Can we talk a little bit about the relationship between wonder and creativity? Sure. The relationship is intimate and instantaneous Mm -hmm. and direct because the moment you open to wonder, you're stepping beyond the known. And to me, that's so exciting. I was recently having a look at something I hadn't looked at in a while, which were the notebooks of Leonardo da Vinci. And I was reading a couple of pages in his amazing, you know, he wrote the, from the wrong side of the page uh, and backwards. backwards. <laughs> and, uh, I don't know why, but uh, so you could read it in the mirror. Yeah. yeah. And so, but he was, you know, he came up on this idea of a helicopter. Why couldn't a helicopter work? You know, well, he was 500 years before the the actual technology became available, a lot of things had to happen. But just to have, I mean, imagine what it would be like to be able to draw such a thing mm-hmm. for the first time 500 years ago and say, here's how it could possibly work. To me, that's humankind as our very best is when we're humble enough to open up and just let something new through. You know, my experience, too, is that creativity bubbles up from inside. And uh, and so the more that we can remove debris that's in the way of that flow, the flow that's always there. So uh, like to do lists and criticism and uh, trying to control other people and the things that that usually go on in interaction. So the more that I have an open space of wonder inside uh, creativity just bubbles up in there. And then it, it's really kind of like uh, getting a present all the time. Like, oh, look what's arising. It, it almost sounds uh, a little bit that there's a relationship with beliefs. Like what we believe can impact how open and creative we can be. Yeah. And I, I I know a lot of this work uh, is around, you know, breaking limiting beliefs and, and, and replacing them with, empowering beliefs how do you help people do that without like maybe a potential if there's such thing an overcorrection and leading people into like maybe a delusion oh that's a really good question uh, i just flipped back we were talking about leonardo i mean look back at those things that were happening four or five hundred years ago like the belief that the earth was the center of the universe <laughs> And what you had to then account for because everything didn't fit that model. So, you know, they had scientists, they had models of where a star would go around and then all of a sudden it would go bloom and (laughs) and do something unusual just to make it fit. But that's just one belief. But look at what that one belief Mm. caused as far as delusion goes. And and yet it's a very hard one to let yeah. go of. People got burnt at the stake for claiming that. Uh, now we have it a little bit easier. Maybe you get shamed on Twitter or something if you have some uh, belief like that. But it's not like being burnt at the stake unless you ha- happen to live in a place, um, you know, like there are countries that uh, are very discriminatory about gay people and uh, where you can actually get executed for that. And so depending on where you are, how thick the belief Mm -hmm. systems are in a particular area. Fortunately, in the West, anyway, we mostly live in a place where you can take on your own belief structure and not have to worry about uh, getting uh, inconvenienced for it. One of the ways that I think of that is um, that our, our old beliefs create old stories. 
and that we live out those old stories. And if somebody gives us the first line to a story, we can just complete that. Like the old story of that there are villains, victims, and heroes. And that's the only thing that goes on. And what I think stands in the way of us making, uh, creating new stories is the fear, the experience of fear and the, the contraction of fear where we feel that I'm, I'm safe inside of these old beliefs, as long as I don't challenge anything, you know, but if I step out of that, whoa, you know, what's, uh, you know, people are going to get me. And, um, you know, people have had experiences too of being punished for stepping out of an old belief. So playing with the old story, really befriending fear, and then beginning to create new stories. And one of the most powerful things we found is that your new story starts with one choice. So if you just change one thing, just for example, you know, if you you find yourself hunched over your computer and the old belief is, oh, gosh, I'm working so hard and, you know, I just have to work hard because life is hard. And, and then you simply, you know, get up and change your posture, take a few breaths. Oh, it's a whole new world. And we underestimate the, the power of making one choice. When you guys are sharing uh, that, particularly as it relates to, you know, new empowering beliefs and falling into delusion, have you are you guys familiar um, with the poem "Monet Refuses the Operation"? Yes. Yeah, I was thinking about that um, that line where it says, uh, "In the background is this." It's a fictional poem, kind of based on Monet's eyesight, and he's refusing eye surgery. Mm -hmm. And he said, he's telling the doctor, it said, it's been, it's taken me all my life to see that gas lamps are angels. <laughs> oh, wow. wow. Yeah. I, yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, it's a wonderful quote. Yes. I had forgotten that line. That's who wrote beautiful. That poem? Uh, Lisa Mueller. I'll, I'll, I'll send it Thank to you. you guys after. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's one other ones. It was, uh, he's saying, uh, I won't return to a land of objects that don't know each other. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> that, that nice? Oh, yeah, that's wonderful. We, we always go to visit Monet when we're in yes. an area where he's uh, being just depicted. Yeah. Well, I know one of the cores uh, of your work, uh, particularly in The Big Leap, was this concept of the upper limit problem. You know, we're talking about a lot of this, you know, we're talking about transcending fear going into more, stepping into a more empowering beliefs, making a single choice. But sometimes this thing called the upper limit problem <laughs> might show up. What is, what is, for listeners who aren't familiar, what is the upper limit problem? The upper limit problem is about how we sabotage ourselves when things start going better. And it's based on old limiting beliefs that were put into place usually before you got your lunch box and toddled <laughs> off to school for the first time. And so um, it comes back also to the subject of fear, because what happens is when you start doing better, when you start feeling better, when you start making more money, you push up against all limiting beliefs like, do I deserve love? Do I deserve the good things of life? Do I deserve to be successful? And a lot of people have old limiting beliefs that are pain inducing, like, yes, I can be successful, but I must feel constant pain <laughs> to punish myself for it. Or no, I can't be successful. I have to be somewhere behind that and always be in a process of yearning for something different. So some upper limit problems are about um, being afraid of the no, uh, the unknown, going out into the unknown and getting beyond whatever beliefs you have. Another big belief that I've found a lot of people have, especially uh, creative people, is a belief that they don't deserve the spotlight, mm -hmm. that uh, it's okay for the light to shine on other people, but <laughs> I don't deserve to be the star of my own mm -hmm. show. And we want to just blow a whistle on all mm -hmm. that and say, let's open up to what we can really be if we can get beyond some of those upper limit uh, beliefs that I document in The Big Leap. And so it's not all that hard. <laughs> it's just having, you know, 
without a screwdriver, a screw looks impossible, mm -hmm. you know, but once you have this little gadget in your hand, it becomes very, very easy. And the same thing with upper limit. Once you understand that they're all based in fear, then you start getting a sense of where you feel fear in your body and get a conversation going with fear. And then you understand that, oh, it's because of old limiting beliefs that I've been carrying around for a long time. Where did I get those? So you begin to inquire into them and open up and mm -hmm. shine light on them. And that's a great journey. In mm -hmm. fact, uh, my latest book, Your Big Leap Year, breaks down into one day at a time, kind of 366 days of little leaps. That yeah, little bite-sized choices. Yeah. Yes, things that take only 30 seconds or a minute, maybe. When you're sharing that, I, I think it encourages people to reevaluate their relationship with fear. The other day, I was in an episode with uh, Jerry Colonna, who's an author and speaker, and he, we were talking about the concept of resistance. And he described resistance as the moment when you're getting close to the goal. Yes. Yes. So reshaping mm -hmm. fear, I'm like, okay, great. We're getting somewhere now. Yeah, that's a great way to look at it too. Yeah. Because if you really look at what's happening with fear, it's a upsurge of energy mm -hmm. that's designed to solve some problem you don't know how to solve yet. You know, And so if you look at it that way, it becomes a very creative kind of thing. The other, the other concept that you speak, spoke about in the big leap and then build on with subsequent books is the zone of genius yes. where, you know, your natural abilities are innate and you get into a state of flow. Um, something that, you know, comes up or people think about is, you know, what would you say to somebody who doesn't believe it's possible to spend a hundred percent of their time in their zone of genius? <laughs> or think they need more time or resources to do it? Well, what I say to people is first start with 10 minutes because yeah. I haven't found anybody yet that had, couldn't squeeze 10 minutes somewhere out of their day. And I've been, you know, I've worked with people that run 50,000 person corporations. They're busy. I know they're busy. And I've worked with people that don't do anything like that and they're busy too. But <laughs> <laughs> what we have to do is, Make a commitment first to just spending a few minutes each day opening up your conversation with what is my genius? What do I most love to do? I think that that first 10 minutes mm -hmm. is the hardest one to put in mm -hmm. your calendar. You know, but I suggest that people actually start with 10 minutes a day, even if during that 10 minutes you just sit there and look at a wall and say, what is my mm, genius? What, is my, yeah. what do I most love mm. to do? So just get into a conversation with it in a little bit, because I know that 10 minutes is going to lead to 20 minutes and yeah. 30 minutes, but you have to do it organically. And what I hear Gay saying also is that it's the practice and recommitment, which is what gets you from 10 minutes to 100%. And the what I also wanted to say about genius is that the experience of genius is easy. Something that you really love to do. I like to invite people to look back to as a kid, what did you just love to do where one time disappeared and you got more energy. So I, when I'm in my genius, I can just keep going. And the, the act of being in that level of creativity gives energy to me and to whoever is in the vicinity. And so the the I, I also think that appreciation is a pathway to genius and that we can support the people around us by really recognizing what it is that they do so skillfully that nobody else really could do. And it seems easy for them. And of course, a lot of people will say, oh, it couldn't be genius because it's just so easy because we have this sense that it's got to be hard. And so we can support other people, too, in opening up to their unique genius that doesn't have to be a thing that you produce or a product. It could be a quality of being that you have that allows other people around you to open up to their creativity. And so you're a good co-creative uh, partner. So um, coming from the sense of it's easy. And if it's hard, you've probably slipped out of your zone of genius. <laughs> how, would, how would you describe, Katie, how would you describe Gay's zone of genius? Oh, and then Gay, yeah. I guess I would be curious, if you, how would you describe Katie's? 
Okay, great. Well, I'm going to go first because I was just seeing an image of one of the um, one of the like ET or uh, when the beam comes down. Gay has a direct connection to the universe, and it just comes down into him. And uh, so I can I can actually see when that's happening for him. He'll be in it, and I'll go. I actually know also not to disturb him because he's receiving <laughs> that um, your your visionary ability to bring the future into the present mm -hmm. right now is I've always admired that about you and from the first time I met you. Mm. <laughs> Thank you. Well, Katie's zone of genius involves a, a zone that includes her brilliant mind and her heart because one of your one aspect of it is that you can reach out and embrace mm things, the opposite, mm -hmm. or <clears throat> things that I remember once we walked into our house and there was this giant Great Dane in our house. We don't have a dog. <laughs> uh, and I'm, not, I'm, I'm scared of dogs, basically. And he was a giant dog. <laughs> I mean, it was really... And, and I, yeah, I froze up, but Katie just went over to him and said, oh, where, where did you come from, you know? And I was just, Wow. Uh, it turned out he he had belonged to the old owners of the house, and he had just come back to visit his old house that we had purchased earlier. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so i i um I have a huge capacity to uh, to love and connect, um, and that's very easy for me. Yeah. Wonderful. You guys run a company together, so a tactical questions about building teams and zone of genius. How do the, how does the zone of genius concept um, impact you know hiring and building companies? Oh, that's a great question. Great Thank question. You. I, I re <laughs> it's part of every conversation we mm -hmm. have around here, especially about a conversation about hiring. You know, we want people to come in and use this opportunity as a way to bring forth their genius and because we know that's going to serve them long after they're here as it happens um people don't leave here <laughs> <laughs> they like it a lot <laughs> we, and and we we give people a lot of room to express their mm -hmm. genius mm -hmm. you know and directly asking them how would you handle this situation or what do you think needs to be done here? And I think that if people are always knowing that that's going to be encouraged, mm -hmm. it makes a big difference. Uh, makes it very easy too, because then people know um, that they're not only doing something for us because we're paying them, but they're doing something for themselves at the same time. And that's an ideal situation. I always tell people, you know, think of yourself it's being in private practice and the universe is your client mm -hmm. and wherever that pulls you, you know, there express your genius. And also when people are, are encouraged to express their genius, there's this interrelating a co-creativity, a kind of a third space where something emerges that can surprise everybody because we're not trying to go down a certain path or make, you know, trying to control it, but really, um, being in ongoing improvisation and so making making friends with the unknown because that's basically what we're doing when we step into creativity is stepping into the unknown and if i if i do that with my whole presence then it can be just a an incredibly fun ride there's something to be learned in each moment yep. um katie in, in 1992 uh, you and gay released conscious loving and then Conscious Loving Ever After in 2015. What did you learn in those years that prompted another release of another version? Uh, I think primarily the, the, uh, the liberation of creativity that comes from uh, the, the practice of commitment and, uh, and co-commitment over and over again and the practice of appreciation. I think the world underestimates the power of deeply appreciating, of being sensitively aware of and, and focusing on what works. And when someone feels appreciated, there's a whole armor that drops off 
And uh, so for me, in fact, in our in Conscious Loving Ever After, we have what we call a customized appreciation interview. So, um, you know, if everybody in the world, their partners and their colleagues knew how they most like to be appreciated, it would really amplify the experience of, ooh, I'm, I'm, I belong here, I can contribute, a sense of opening, which, which leads to creativity rather than the contraction of fear. And, you know, am I doing a good job that most people live in? I think also if we can really highlight that word creativity again, uh, because at midlife especially, which was like conscious loving ever after is for people at midlife, you know, 40, 42, 55, 65, mm -hmm. on up in that area. <clears throat> One of the things that's so important to living a healthy life in that area, that age zone, is creativity. Because like Eric Erickson says, in the great developmental psychology says that every breath you take from 50 and up is a choice between creativity or stagnation, creativity or stagnation. And I've, you know, now I'm in my seventies. I really see the value of those choices in my thirties, forties, and fifties that were in the direction of more creativity rather than just going through the motions and doing mm -hmm. things. Same that, old, same old stuff. What would you say to somebody hoping to cultivate more creativity? 10 minutes. <laughs> 10 minutes. It's, it's very similar. There's a connection between the creativity and the zone of genius. Yeah, absolutely. So if I'm... Uh, yeah, or, go or, ahead. or even something simpler, mm -hmm. like within the next hour, eat something that you've never eaten before. Uh, within the next hour, brush your teeth with the opposite hand than you usually use. Yeah. You know, something interrupt. This interrupt the old pattern of flow and mm -hmm. get something new going in the system. It's really powerful. I remember I, Gay's been doing this since I first met him. We would be, uh, you know, when we first got together, we'd be driving somewhere and I knew where we were going, but he'd be heading off in this different direction. And, <laughs> and I'd say, well, Where are we going? And he said, Well, I'm just going a different way. I'm just going <laughs> to. I, you know, I just felt like making a different choice. <laughs> um, you mentioned commitment. Um, curious, what challenges have you guys experienced oh. as a couple and, and how how did you get through them? Well, first of all, commitment yeah. is one of the least understood but least, most important things because a lot of people think commitments come from up here. Mm -hmm. But real commitment comes from down here. You have to be mm -hmm. able to feel the commitment in yourself. Mm -hmm. Then the other thing you have to be sensitive to is your counter commitments that are stored down in there somewhere that every time you make a commitment. I mean, look, I was just reading about Sir Edmund Hillary and, and Tenzing uh, uh, Norgay that first climbed Mount Everest and <clears throat> which, by the way, is pronounced Everest. The person who actually had it named after him is named Everest. Oh, wow. I just learned this the other day, about 10 days ago. Oh, wow. So you can imagine how it changed my life. <laughs> None. <laughs> uh, but um, anyway, can you imagine as they got closer mm. and closer to the summit, that recommitment had to be made Every, every every second, probably. Yeah. A friend of mine, Rick Ridgway, was um, one of the first people to climb K2 without oxygen. And K2 is supposedly even a tougher mountain than Mount Everest. <laughs> and um, But uh, Rick told me, he was visiting here one day, and he told me that the last 200 feet or so, he had to take one step and then basically reinvent his life to take the next step. And then yeah. to do it all over again. And that last 200 feet, I, you know, took hours mm -hmm. because it had to be done in that kind of uniting your soul with your body one more time. And blessings to people that do that. That sounds like a bad day at the beach to me. I wouldn't go near anything like that. But what, I, what I'm hearing, too, and what Gay is saying is that when we make a commitment, the counter commitment is likely to come up because mm -hmm. you're actually shining a light on uh, anything that might be preventing you from going from here to there. And the mistake that so many people make is when the counter commitment comes up, they go, oh, yeah, 
I'm a fail. And they give up rather than simply course correcting and recommitting. So we found there isn't much value in beating yourself up and going, oh, I did it again, but going, oh, there's my counter commitment. And now I'm recommitting and I'm going to take another step in that direction. And then that builds your skill in moving toward what you want. And the counter commitment's going to come up. Upper limits are going to come up. And so one of the things I commit to and I recommend for others is let your upper limit be friendly. It's actually possible to have your upper limits uh, occur in a way that's friendly rather than having something fall on your head. You could, something could nudge you and go, oh, mm. okay, there that is. Yeah, or, or develop a new benign belief system inside yeah. that says, I would prefer to learn my lessons with a feather tickle rather than a sledgehammer. <laughs> you know, just kind of open yourself to learning in a gentler way. Yeah, if you can hear the lessons as a whisper, you won't have to hear them as a shout. Yeah, uh -huh. I, that's a good way to oh, put it. Yeah. Wonderful. Um, I was curious, how, how do you guys think about what we're seeing in the world right now, particularly on the internet, where there's so many people sharing in quotes, all the answers, <laughs> but the status quo doesn't seem to be changing. And in fact, it seems to be reinforcing a comparative state. Mm. What do you guys make of that? Well, I, my, my first thought is that that's fear run. And so, and if I'm in fear, one, I can't think I'm, I've moved to my gorilla, you know, my, actually my Godzilla brain, and I can't really think. And the other is that other people become the enemy. And it's a, something that we're not aware of. And so the befriending fear is really a, a first step to shifting that pattern. But here's another thing to contemplate. This whole new set of technologies has only been with us, you know, with Just a wink a blink, of an eye. You know, in our and, lifetimes. <laughs> yeah, so it's got a lot of maturing to do. Imagine how, you know, the first people who wrote things were often graffiti, like um, <laughs> one of my favorite uh, philosophers, uh, Heraclitus, um, in ancient Greek times, he would come down in the middle of the night and write a truth on a wall. And then his students would gather the next day. He, he didn't like to hang out with them directly, <laughs> but he would sneak down and write the piece of wisdom. Like one of them was, you can never step in the same river twice. And then his students would gather around. Mm -hmm. But on the downside of that, some of them, some of them would say like, Heraclitus sucks. You know, they would, that's what they would write. <laughs> yeah, uh, about, he doesn't know what he's talking about. Yeah. So from the beginning of technology, you're going to have some uh, haters and all that kind of thing. So I think we're sifting through a period mm. of learning on the Internet where people are hopefully learning to be more gracious to each other and be more accepting. Um, but if you look at our Congress, for example, you can also see that a lot of people rise to very high positions in society while maintaining a basic sixth or seventh grade little boy uh, <laughs> sense of uh, emotional development in there. In fact, yeah. I, I wouldn't want to compare our Congress uh, uh, to uh, teenage boys because uh, I, I wouldn't want to I think that's more advanced than, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Understood. Um, kind of on that kind of economic, political front, you know, how do you think about the role of the abundant mindset in a world where economic constraints can limit upward mobility? Oh, the way I look at that is an abundance mindset is a starting place and it's a viral thing that will catch on, uh, you know, and, and it will catch on fast in some areas and slow in other areas. But, you know, like I see miracles happening in places where I wouldn't have thought they were possible. Mm -hmm. You know, like one of the things we encourage and support is the uh, Grameen Bank of Mohammed Yunus, you know, and to, to organize, to be able to produce, for example, a very inexpensive cell phone that women collectives use to do business now in places in Pakistan and Bangladesh that they weren't able to do that before. To me, that's you know, that's what happens as a result of an abundance mindset. Somebody looks at a $500 cell phone, Mohammed Yunus, and said, hey, with a certain type of cardboard and everything, we could produce this for 25 cents. 
and then we could distribute them them in the third world. Well, you know, it's got to start somewhere. Mm-hmm. Somebody's got to see, look at something and say, here's a possibility of how more people could benefit from that. And also, um, the research is really clear that when women are supported and women are empowered, that society thrives. And so um, the the recent uptick of, you know, fear and hatred about women, um, which has been very disturbing for many of us, I think the antidote to that is really uh, getting over your fear of women and fear of women's creativity and supporting women to be partners in co-creating society. Yeah, wonderful. One last one for you, as you guys have helped so many uh, bring more meaning to their lives and richness and such, what have you learned about the ingredients for a meaningful life? Mm. Mm -hmm. Well, every moment you can be asking yourself, what do I most love? What Mm -hmm. most needs to be loved in me? What could be loved in the other person? It begins because love is the best thing human beings have come up with so far. Mm -hmm. And wherever we got this idea, it's a darn good one. And so to ground everything and ultimately Mm -hmm. grounding what you say in love and grounding what you think in love, it's, um, it's a big thing that's, uh, you know, you could say it's slow to catch on, but it's gaining ground all the time because every moment a person loves something that's unlovable in themselves, it liberates another burst of energy that can be used Mm -hmm. to serve your genius. I would add to that, shifting from working on things to playing, uh, that play is such an underutilized power that we all have that we delegate to kids, but then we, you know, we sort of push it out of them by the time they get out of school. And so uh, we know now that the uh, creating a new neural pathway, a new connection, an aha, if you're working on it, can take you up to 400 repetitions. But if you're playing, it takes 20. So play is not only more fun, but it's more effective. Yeah, more play. (laughs) What's the best, uh, before I let you go, what's the best way for people to keep up with you and the work you're doing? We we have two websites. One is um, Hendrix.com and the other is foundationforconsciousliving.org, which is our nonprofit where we have lots of different videos and ways for people to join in our community. We have free classes and lots of ways for people to practice the things that we've been talking about. And Hendrix.com has the list of our seminars uh, that um, for those of you who might want to study with us. Well, we'll have links to both those in the episode right up, but it's so great to be with you and thank you for coming on the show. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. Nice talking to you. Thank you for listening to Tuesdays and Morrissey. That conversation was with Gay and Katie Hendricks. They have been leaders in the field of leadership and professional development for nearly 50 years and have written more than 40 books, including Conscious Loving and The Big Leap. What I enjoyed about the episode was their emphasis on creativity and how that can be an anecdote to bring more meaning and fulfillment to our lives. If you enjoyed the show, share it with a friend, and we'll see you here soon. Thanks.